right. This was a lot better when there was no one in here. I'm the guy that sits back in the corner on the floor because there's people in here. And I have been preaching here, but none of you have been here. So I'm torn with the idea of either, well, having you all sit on the floor so I can't see you, or just have a heart attack right now. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Our Lord and Father, we are grateful for you. We are grateful in this world of weirdness and oddity and crazy times, the new normal, that you remain with us, that you will never leave us, and it is only a question of whether we decide to walk away, but you remain. You do not change. We ask your help in getting this discussion about this difficult topic of divorce, and we ask you to tell us if there's any good news in divorce. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. All right, posted on Facebook on today's comments is this piece of paper that we're running off of-ish. If you have that in your bulletins, people at home can pull it off of Facebook. Most of it's on the PowerPoint. But I wanted to talk today and find out if there's any good news about divorce because other than when you read about people having an amical divorce, which I don't know if that term really exists, that's just sort of something you say, divorces tend to be pretty difficult. And I'll tell you, most of you, probably all of you don't know, I've been divorced. I was married, divorced, and remarried with three kids by the time I was 21. Now, it's a little helpful that I graduated high school at 16, so I had a little more time to be stupid than most of you. So I'm not here to act like I'm preaching on a topic I haven't participated in, uh, a difficult time that I know personally with my first wife. I've also since then been married three more times, but no divorces, thankfully, all to the same girl. So, Sandy and I have been married three times. The, first mar the second marriage only lasted a week. We had a celebration down south and then came up here and did a celebration up here on our 25th wedding anniversary. So, that's how you get married three times, but don't have any divorces to the same girl. It's much easier getting married to the same girl, by the way, without divorce. I just recommend that version of events to us. But what happens in most divorces in general, just to put a broad brush in it, is that somehow we figure out how not to be trusted. Whatever the breakdown is, whatever the details are, somehow the ability to be trusted is lost. And in that breakdown of trust, there seems to be for most people, and in my case, no road back. That there isn't a way to regain that trust that you had in the beginning. And because of that, it's really hard to stay with somebody you can't trust. And, and people end up with this thing we call divorce. And it has lots of bad connotations it, to it, lots of difficulties, um, lots of uh, challenges. Am I not doing the... Oh, there's the remote. All right. So one of the verses that comes to mind when you're working through divorce, and I'm having trouble with the remote a little bit. I don't seem to know how to run it very well. In the back there, do you know why I'm not? Okay, there we go. Is Malachi 2.16. The God of Israel says that he hates divorce. It covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. That seems like a weird turn-on phrase for us, train your garment with violence. But when you look at the definition of those words, it's, the garment is who you are, your raiment, your personality. And the violence that happens is this injustice and distrust. And 
pretty much everybody who hasn't had an amicable divorce can tell you it is a personal, difficult, miserable time and season trying to undivide the things that you have and to rearrange your life without the person that you made these promises to. But when you get married to them, you can't imagine this happening. When on your wedding day, I mean, it is nothing but bright days ahead. You can't imagine that there would be some day that everything that you know couldn't be true about this person or about yourself. And when you're getting a divorce as a believer, you're also faced with verses like this, that God is charging you with violence, and you shouldn't be doing this very thing. So it's difficult on you personally, even as you can't find a way to be trustworthy or to trust the other person, you also find out that it seems like God is against you in this decision as well. In Hosea, which is probably one of the biggest, the whole book really deals with the divorce, and the basic story is about a guy who God says, I want you to go marry a girl who's somewhat untrustworthy and marry her anyway. And she's going to be also untrustworthy while you're married to her. And I want you to continue that way because that's what we're like. God is telling the story of Hosea and he's describing what we're like. We as members of God's family are often untrustworthy in that relationship toward God. We get distracted. We go after other ideas. On our baptism day, when we're over here, wherever we do our baptism, we feel like that relationship with God will go on and on without any breaking, that it will only get more deeper and more amazing and more exciting, and we can't wait to buzz about it. And then as time goes on, we decide that maybe school's really important. Maybe being a hero at school is important. Our job becomes important. Trying to make our retirement becomes important. Our own recreation becomes important. And suddenly, we don't feel so close to God. And that's what God's telling us. That's what we're like. But somehow looking at that statement, and the statement before, it's kind of like when you pick up a pair of binoculars. I don't know if you've done this. As a kid, you can do this. This is kind of fun. If you get a set of binoculars, go home and try this. Probably done it already. As you look through one end of these binoculars, and you think, why would anybody use this? Everything is even farther away and smaller than I think. This is a stupid thing to have. The thing's ridiculous. Why does anybody want binoculars? It makes everything harder to see and smaller. And then we turn it around, and all of a sudden it's like, whoa! Now they're right at our nose. And a lot of what we read in the Bible, I think, happens that we're looking at it in the wrong direction. We're often looking at things in the Bible and saying that it's something about us that God's making us do, some big rule that is impossible to keep, no one can do it, and it's sort of, for some people, it feels like God's setting us up to fail, giving us a rule that can't be followed. No one's able to do it. And for some people, that causes them to stop coming here. Their life spins away from baptism, and their world is difficult, and they feel like they're failing us because we're all perfect, right? Everybody in here is doing perfect, right? No problems. We're all happy in the Lord. Nothing bad happening to us. And they stop coming because they feel like they can't do this, they're failing. The perfect people like us, who are getting everything right, and they're not one of us. And I hope you know by now, I'm not that person. I don't even know why I'm up here, quite frankly. 
because I'm not that person. I'm a hot mess all week long. I'm a hot mess right now. I had to go outside for a minute to catch a breath before I came back up here. God knows what we're really like. And if we turn these binoculars around, most of what God is talking about to us is really about who he is and how he's wanting to help us. All right, somebody back there is going to have to move the slides because I can't do it. I'm sorry. Jesus spoke against divorce as well. And mostly what Jesus spoke about divorce was all these tricky ways we keep trying to figure out how it's okay to do it. And Jesus told us, that's silly. God only gave that to you because that's something that you wanted and you felt you needed. But that isn't what God is like. And God's view on divorce is really more about us understanding what God is like. Even though we're untrustworthy. And even though we continue to mess up. And we continue to fail even after becoming part of God's team, he's still taking us back. He won't divorce us. You can leave. You can walk away from God. You can go that direction. But God's not going to walk away from you. And he's not going to give up on you. He already knows when you agree to marry him, he already knows what you are like, And he already knows how you're going to continue to fall over. He knows that up front. When we get married, we marry perfect people. And then we live with them. And perfect people, what? Leave the toilet seat up? Put their clothes on the floor, not in the hamper? Don't shut the cabinet doors? Leave the peanut butter jar open with the lid open? Don't replace the toilet paper on the roll? Leave their bike out where the cars park. Toys scattered all over the floor. None of you have that happening in your house. Just my house. You're all looking at me like, what? Well, some of those things happen in my house. Well, in my house, she leaves the toilet seat down. And that's bothering me. We've had many a discussion about that. But the Bible is really revealing to us that God knows we're those kinds of people. And he knew that going in. Hosea is about that. He knew going in what we're like and said, that's okay. And I know after you're connected with me, you're still going to wander off. And all I need for you is to turn around back toward me because I'm ready. Like the prodigal son's father, I'm ready to take you back. You cannot go so far that I won't take you back. That's the good news about divorce and God. You just got to turn back. He'll take you in. And he knew ongoing, if you read Hosea, he knows going in already that while he picked us, that picking doesn't change us. It's a process for us to grow, for us to change, for us to be returned to his image. Because that's not where we are when we start. But he wants to restore us that way. In Hosea, at the end of Hosea, and there's a couple of places that Hosea covers the story, he says, I'm the Lord your God. And ever since the land of Egypt, and that's reminding us where we were lost without God, we were slaves, I again make you dwell in tents as in the day of the appointed feast. I will be like dew to Israel. Lengthen his roots, his branches shall spread. His beauty shall be like an olive tree. God is ready always. God has designed the whole scenario for us, the whole relationship for us to know that he's never saying no to us. He's never abandoning us. He's never leaving us. The end of the story in Hosea is a people that were picked because they were broken. In the marriage, they remained broken. But when they're ready to return, when they're ready to remain, when they're ready to stay, they don't have to fight their way back to God. You don't have to convince God to love you. You don't have to beg God to accept you. 
because always, like the sun shining outside, he is what he is. And whether it's a cloudy, rainy day, as Pastor D. Ray prayed for, people from the north, California is not about rain, it's about sunshine. Silly Canadians. But even if it's cloudy and rainy, the sun is still shining above those clouds. It doesn't change. And God doesn't change. He continues to love unconditionally like the sun. That does not change at all. Further down in Hosea 6.6, 6, God says, I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God more than burnt offerings. And this is one of those Old Testament ideas, I think, that even carries to today in some weight. But we have figured out in some ways that God wants our behavior to change. And we focus a lot of time on this. We focus a lot of time on sacrifices and offerings. And we think if we do those enough, then God can reaccept us and let us back in. Or we can stay in and God won't kick us out. And this isn't just the message of Jesus in the New Testament. This is an Old Testament message that God isn't really about the sacrifice and the offerings, but that we know who God is because that's what makes the everything else happen. We can't skip over the step of knowing who God is. If we know who God is, it will produce a people of mercy and if there's anything the world needs right now, my friends, is a world of mercy. There's all this anger and frustration and mocking and challenging. and I mean, people are just, I can't, I, they're angry. Driving, walking, on Facebook, all over the place. It's just angry, angry, angry. And what God wants us to know is, if you know who God is, it will change who you are and the things that you do. That's true. And so when you look at what you're doing, we have a sense of your relationship with God. But you can't skip over the knowing God step and just go from a person that did bad things to a person that does good things. You're missing the crucial middle step, my friends. And that is to know God for you. Because if the good things happen because God's inside you and living inside you, then those are the good things. But if the good things are happening because you're just trying to not do the bad things, then you've misunderstood the message. The message is not that you should not do the bad things and be a doer of the good things. You've really missed the whole middle tent pole that holds the tent up. The piece that holds it up is if you're broken, because if you just try to do the good things, you're going to fail. You can't do it on your own. It happens out of you knowing God and God moving inside you that the good things happen from that. It's a natural response. So, yes, there are good behaviors and good actions. I'm not I'm not a keep doing the bad things and stay with God guy. But I think you have to know who God is. And God is this person that knows everyone is messed up, including me here. I know it's not, not you, it's me. But he's still okay with that. And is inviting me to turn around and walk toward him. So the next slide, are there any more clues that we can have out of Scripture about what God says about this, about returning to His love in Hosea, and is there more good news for us? Because this is really, hopefully, what comes out of Hosea, both at the end of chapter 2 and the end of the book, is how God explains how the relationship is fully restored. And you can, in the marriage that I'm in now, Sandy and I have been together for, we're on our 35th year, we did have, a, in our own marriage, a season of broken trust as well. And we had a really rocky, three super hard years, I would say. 
more of seven to work it all the way out, but three really miserable years in the middle where divorce was really an option and an opportunity. But instead, we worked on recovery, and we worked on boundaries, we worked on restoring trust. And now we're in a super healthy, comfortable place with each other. And that time was really, really difficult, but now it's even hard to remember it. I mean, we sort of know it as a factual item in our relationship, but it doesn't dwell in us all the time. We have almost but forgotten it, except for me to tell you about it. But most of it is just sort of like a list of stuff that happened. I don't even really feel it anymore because that season is fully restored. And that is what God is willing and able to do in all of us, is to restore us from those broken places. So let's look at Luke 17. God says, if he sins against you seven times in a day, and seven times in a day returns to you, I repent, you shall forgive him. And this is really not even so much a rule about us behaving, but turn the binoculars around and say, this is God's image, and this is God telling us what he's like. He's ready to forgive us. All we have to do is turn around and receive it. It's like turning your back against the sun and hiding under a rock. You can't get forgiveness if you don't turn back toward it. But if you turn toward it, it's there for you. Just turn around. It's there for you. And it doesn't say, say you're sorry, by the way. You look up that word repent, it isn't about saying you're sorry. I know we do that a lot with little kids. They hurt each other. Say you're sorry. Shake hands. But it isn't really that. It's about just turning around and facing God as he is. He's there to forgive you. You can goof up and mess up seven times 70. He's going to forgive you. He is forgiving you. And the understanding of that, who he is in that constant love relationship can hopefully begin to turn you to something that you can't maybe imagine right now. A world where you don't have to fail and where doing the right thing is just something that happens out of you. Not something that you're trying to do, but something that happens because God's inside you, inspiring you, encouraging you, and helping you change. In 1 Timothy, God our Savior, who desires that all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. What kind of men? Just the good Adventists? Is that what it says? Or it's just the Christians now, right? It says just the Christians, right? This is every person, and this isn't just all men. We're not talking about the boys, right? Remember, the Bible means all people in this case, in this way. It's not a man-girl thing, but all people. God wants everyone to be saved. We could run down a mental list of the unsavable, can't we? Do you have a list in your mind of the unsavable? There's not a list of unsavable in God's mind. Everybody is on God's savable list. Everybody. Put whatever label of group you have in your unsavable list. I mean, right now, is it Democrats or is it Republicans, right? In election season. After 9 11, it was Muslims, right? It, there's always a list for some folks of unsavable. Sometimes you can feel unsavable personally. You can feel that you have made a mistake so big that God can't forgive you, can't save you, can't love you. But friends, that's not the heart of God. That may be our heart, but that's not the heart of God. God does not have a list of unsavable. There may be a group of people that walk away from saving, but that's not the same thing. That's not the same thing. 
you walk away from it. You can stay at the bottom of the pool where you can't get any air. But if you turn around and go back to the surface, air is at the surface no matter what you do. It's there. If you stay at the bottom of the pool, air is not coming to you. But if you turn around, if you repent and go back to the top of the pool, the air is there remaining, waiting, available to you if you decide to go back to it. It doesn't change what, because of what you've done. And then we get to a foundational place for me in 1 John. Because God is love. And without going too deep on a tangent, I, this is a rock foundational box for me. God is love. This is, a, this is a main piece of me. God is love. I don't always know it but I decide to believe it even if I don't know it to be true at times when I'm broken. But God is love. And so when there's people out there and tragedy happens and they say, everything happens for a reason, it's all in God's plan, I say, no it isn't. No it isn't. There are unlovable things happening right now. There are evil things happening right now. Don't call evil good. Because it's not all God's doing. God is love. So if what's happening to you right now is unlovable, it's not something God is doing. And it isn't your lack of faith. It isn't your lack of obedience. It isn't your lack of coming to church on time. Your failure to tithe on time. Your failure in any of your behaviors. You can wander from God and have things happen to you that you've chosen. You goofed around, you stayed up too late, then you overslept, and now you're late for work, driving in your car, and you're asking God to move the sun back ten steps so you can be to work on time. None of that was God's doing. You're going to be late for work. And God didn't make you late. It was that little voice at 9.30 that said, you should be home right now. I'm having too much fun to go home. That's not on God. That's all you, kid. That's all on you. Trying to function at work the next day. Oh, man. But even in the worst of things that are happening right now, if they don't fit in this box that God is love, friends, they are not of God. There are principalities and powers, evil things, one-third of the angels on this place designed to trick you, deceive you, discourage you, to convince you to do something else. You say, well... I don't know exactly what you mean when you say God is love. So let's look at the list of what love is. Love suffers long and is kind. So if the person you're interacting with, if the situation happening to you isn't kind to you, if it isn't bearing more of the burden than you are, It might be something else. And if you don't feel like being like this, friends, it isn't about you trying to suffer harder, but about you knowing who God is. Because when God moves in, this is part of what happens to you. It's not about I'm giving you this list to do this. I'm saying go know God. Because if God moves in, your instincts will change. The position you find yourself naturally in will be in a long-suffering position. Does not envy. Does not parade itself. Is not puffed up. Does not behave rudely. If you've seen me in a meeting looking for a joke, you'll know I'm rude at times. Does not seek its own. That ties together with that long-suffering part. 
is not provoked and thinks no evil. In some versions, if you read the Bible, it thinks no evil as God keeps no record of wrongs. God is love and thinks no evil, meaning he doesn't have any evil things happening to you. And he doesn't keep record of any evil things you're doing. Because that's not how it works. He's just loving you. You're either going toward that or away from that. But God is this. Not provoked, thinks no evil, does not rejoice in iniquity or a fight with you, but rejoices in the truth. Bears all things. Bears all things. Long-suffering and kind, does not seek its own. Those are all tied together, right? Believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. Real love from God never changes this list. And it can and live in you. And you can be a person similar to this list if God is in. But this isn't a list to challenge you to be like this. That's not what it is. But it is a list of what God is like. So when things are happening that don't seem like this list, I would submit to you, and I'm not the pastor or an elder even, I'm just a dude who hides in the back, is saying, that's not of God, it seems to me. This is what God's like. And when I'm trying to figure out what's going on in the world is confusing and distraction, I try to look at this list to find out if I think it's coming out of God or it's coming from somewhere else. This is a foundational place for me personally. So let's look at Isaiah 43.25, which was a scripture text. I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. And I know we have a vision of God erasing this list that he's keeping. And there is stuff about blotting out your transgressions. But the last of that sentence is he doesn't remember them. It's not forgive and forget. It's forgotten. It's not in his mind at all. As, as though it had never existed. And if you look at the original Hebrew in here, that's exactly what it's saying. It is not erased. It's gone. It's not there at all. Your sins are not on the list. And that's that quote out of 1 Corinthians 13, 5. Love keeps no record of wrong. Love is not evil. This stuff is not in God's mind to forget. It's not in his mind at all. He has forgotten it. The next verse. The wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life. We are already like the people that we are. And all the silly stuff that we're doing, dare say it, stupid stuff that we're doing, just leads to our destruction if it takes us away from God. But God doesn't change. God wants us to have this gift of Jesus who's hanging on the cross, who we decide to kill him, and he says, forgive them. That's what God is. And that's why Jesus came to say, I've shown you the Father. This isn't even really Jesus on the cross. It's Jesus showing us the Father. I know Jesus on the cross, I get that. But he came to show us what the Father was like. And it's the Father saying, I know what you've done. You're confused about me. You don't know what love is really like. I get it. I'm okay with you. You're awesome. Come back. You could be Peter or you can be Judas. The difference between Peter and Judas, really, the only difference is one guy came back and one guy did not. And the guy that didn't come back felt all alone. And that's what happens when we separate from God, really, is you feel terribly alone. All of the things that people try to tell you make you happy, at the end of them, lead you to feel deep loneliness. 
And so God is just asking you to be back with him. Because he knows what we're doing and what we try to do doesn't really work. But if we know that God is giving us eternal life, then maybe that changes us in some way. Revelation 12.10, and this goes along with John 10.10, which is not in your list. But there's an accuser out there, and that accuser has lost and been cast down. Satan is the destroyer, friends. If there is someone doing evil and someone destroying things, that's not God, that's Satan. And Jesus is really clear on this. John is very clear on this. The things that are tormenting you and ruining you and breaking you and making you feel worthless and weak and lost are not of love. They're of the destroyer and trying to break you and keep you turned away from being saved. Because God is awesome. God takes you back if you're willing to come home. Romans 2.15. There's a group of people that show the law written in their hearts, and that's really the core of what we're meaning to do. Whether you're, quote, Greek, Gentile, or Jew... God was always wanting the same thing as he said in Hosea and other places, that you are having God live in you, that you are a converted people that naturally, by what's now inside you, have this natural different response than the one you had before. Not because you've learned the list and done it better, but because you have people that God is inside and you've been changed by that. Because you're already forgiven. In Hosea, when he picks Gomer, he knows who he's talking about, who he's marrying and why, and he already knows she's going to fail in the marriage, but he's picking her anyway, and that's God. He's picked you anyway. You cannot be so far lost, you can't come join us, and you can't be so far friends that are with us that he isn't going to keep you if you want to stay here. You're in if you choose to stay in. You're in. He's happy to have you back. Super delighted, super excited, super amazing. So we get to 2 Corinthians 5.14. And this, I think, is very relevatory about what the list and the list keeping isn't it. It's the love of Christ that compels us. If Christ has moved into you, you are compelled differently. So if you don't feel compelled and you don't want to, I just ask you how much you're looking at Jesus, that's all. I don't ask you to try harder. I think that's a complete miss, me personally. It's just who you know. Because I really know who Sandy is, I have a lot of freedom and flexibility in my choices because I know how she'll end up on the position. It's like being on a really good team of a sport. Whether you play soccer or baseball or hockey, there's an automatic dance in a well-trained team that people just know where they go. And if you're, say, playing softball (coughs) and you get the ball, you can throw it where it should be going even before the person is there because you know the person that needs to be there will be there in time for the ball. You just know each other. You can rely on each other. Everyone is compelled by the same understanding. That happens in sports coaching on a team. And so with God, when you're with godly people, you can often, Sandy can make promises that she doesn't have to check with me because she knows from where I'm coming from and how I'm living, and she can trust and rely on the influences and to make those decisions, knowing where God has already led me. But this isn't about behavior, it's about Christ being in you. That will help you grow and change. So if you don't feel like doing it, it's more about knowing God than it is about you knowing more stuff to do. Next place. For by grace you have been saved through faith. It is God's favor. It is God liking you, loving you, and knowing you. And whether you feel that, and that's where the faith part is, whether you feel that, you got to lean on that. And a guy with mental illness, and that's me, there are times I don't know any of this to be true. I don't feel it to be true. That I feel alone and lost and isolated. But sometimes you just have to say, I 
believe it because I believe it. Not because I know it in any tangible way. I've just decided that this has to be true. It was true before, it has to be true now. I don't have to drop a bowling ball on my foot to test gravity over and over and over. I can just believe it. Because it will happen even if I, I don't have to try it out again. It is what it is. And so there can be times when you don't know this, but that's where the faith part is. You just know it because you know it. And so it's faith. But it's all from God, God's favor. It's the gift of God, even though we're broken. And here's the next one, and this is super familiar to us, especially the first verse. God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him. That's like on the end of the football kicking thing for years. There was a guy or people out there holding up those signs. Probably the most evangelized Bible text on a sports setting anyway. But to me particularly, it's the second part of the verse that, that I have a more affinity to, that God did not send his son in the world to condemn the world, but through the world that he may be saved. It is the mind of God to save us, not try to kill us or destroy us or keep us out of heaven. It's on the mind of God to save everyone. Just like that verse we covered earlier, he desires all to be saved. Everything God has put forward has to rescue everyone, to save everyone, to have everyone feel welcome, everyone to feel loved, everyone to have good news. Even on a world of bad news and big changes, nothing that we all would have predicted. I mean, if I'd have told you last October you'd all be wearing masks right now, I think we'd all agreed to join up and plan a bank robbery in 10 minutes. Now even the bank wants me to show up in a mask. Wait, what? Are you serious? And in this day and age of really brilliant people, we're going to argue about the same argument that they were having in 1918, that masks weren't any good, and we shouldn't need to wear them. I mean, that's how Typhoid Mary gets locked up in a hospital, because she wouldn't stop cooking and infecting people and killing people. And so the government had to lock her up, because every time they let her out, she'd go get another job in a restaurant, and people would die from typhoid, because she didn't believe in germs. And we're still struggling with this. 120 years later, we're still struggling with this. Is it true? Maybe it's fake. It's some kind of scam. I don't know what the scam is unless somebody wants to sell a lot of masks. What's the scam? It's annoying. It's difficult. It's a pain, right? I can't see all you frowning or smiling. Helps me, maybe. It's my own scam to make sure if you're frowning, I don't have to see it. So, I, you know, I don't get it. It's just things that are going on that are evil. But God is here to save us. That's his focus. That's his want. That's what he'd like. Next verse. It's been revealed by the appearing of Jesus who has abolished death and brought life and immortality through the light of the gospel. In anything that you're struggling with, I just ask you to look to Jesus to get in the Gospels, talk to one of us that know Jesus, and see how you can see Jesus better, how you can know God better. Because that is the solution to your problems, is to face toward the Son and not hide away in your pain and your suffering. God wants to restore you, and the solution to that is to know Him better. He wants that for all of us. John 17:3 that this is eternal life, that you may know the only one true God and Jesus Christ whom you sent. You notice there's none of these doing verses. There's not doing, thou shalt not do. It's who you know. That's the big secret. Who you know. Who's your friend? Is God your friend? Because if he's your friend, the rest of the stuff is easy. It works itself out. 
God is with you. He's your friend. Don't change anything. It's not written down, but it's Hosea 2. Some of you had an additional sheet added, and it's in the notes posted. But Hosea 2.14, this is God. After in Hosea 1 that he says, go marry this girl. She's not going to be trustworthy. And she's going to continue not to be trustworthy. But this is the ending of it. I'll bring her and I'll speak comfort to her. I'll give her vineyards from there. She shall sing there as the day in her, year, in her youth. No longer will you call me master, you will call me husband. God doesn't want necessarily that we only see him as the king and the master and the Lord, and we have to hush and be reverent, that we should be crawling on our knees toward him. I mean, it says we should approach the throne of grace boldly. And here God is telling us to be husband and wife. This is a deep, trusting, connected friendship that you're intertwined in a way. And so at times you hear me, I I don't seem so reverent toward God because he's my partner and my spouse and my connection. Not that he isn't creator of the universe and amazing and big and billions of planets and dying on it, all this huge stuff, which is all true. But he's decided, he has decided that we should be co-partners. That he's going to ask me, stupid, broken me, to share him with you. That he's asked me to let you somehow get to know him from me. And I'm the wrong guy for this job. I'm not that good. I'm not that strong. It's like picking on that sports team and everybody's there and we have all the best players and he picks the smallest, weakest person first and says, yep, I I picked that person first. God is huge and amazing and only wants us to be connected to him. I will betroth you to me forever. Yes, I will betroth you to me and righteous and justice, and loving kindness and mercy, I will betroth you to me in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. And this betrothing is a marriage word. <laughs> Getting connected in a marriage way. God is wanting to be married to us. To have us in a whole, for richer or poor, goodness, sickness, and health, forever and ever. And no death to do us part. No death. Last slide. We may be wandering away, but God loves us. Whether you've never come in or whether you're here and you get confused and distracted and move off to shiny objects, all God wants is for you to turn around. That's who He is. He's love. He's long-suffering, he's kind, he bears no wrongs, he keeps no records. He lives to love you. And he lives to have that love grow inside of you and spark into you what you were always meant to be, which is a person in a deep, intimate relation with the creator of the universe. He's put that for you. And what you do in that, you can collect garbage, You can program computers, you can sing, you can be a doctor, or you can be a dog catcher. What you're doing in that matters not so much as that you know God. The people that he picked for his disciples were fishermen, me, trash collectors, tax collectors. Not people we pick on a winning team of bright, brilliant minds to build the church. It's all right. Babies are fine. I'm like that all the time at my house. It's totally okay. That's just me at my house. God's never going to divorce you. He's never going to leave you. He's never going to forsake you. And even if you feel completely alone, and I live in that space too much, 
He's still there. When Jesus hung on the cross in the last three hours of darkness, and he said, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus felt, he expressed it, we heard him feel that alone. God knows the whole experience of being a person. The whole experience. He knows how hard this is. It isn't that he didn't live in exactly our shoes. But it isn't going to change how much he loves us. How hard he's going to work to bring us home. Because the easiest thing, I think, when I make a mistake, I just take an eraser and I erase it out. He's not about that. He's about fixing it, restoring it, and letting you rejoin the family. So my friends, that is the very best of the good news. Loving Father, I know I don't have to pray that you'll bless us because you do. I know that you let rain fall on the just and the unjust alike. It is in your nature to bless us. But I ask you, Lord, to help us grow to know that you are blessing us, that you are with us always, that your Holy Spirit, for those that are willing, will help us know that you are always good all the time, that you are love and long-suffering, and that you are not the destroyer. We ask you, Lord, to put that in our hearts, to let us be changed by that, that we know you as you really are, that you desire all to be saved even those on our unlovable list. And we thank you, Lord, that you don't have an unlovable list for me. In Jesus' name, amen.